Hi, I am Wim Bogaerts from Ghent University in IMEC, and I'll be telling you about the work we've been doing with our colleagues from EPFL, KTH, Tyndall, Comscope, and VLC Photonics in the framework of the project Morphic. We've been working on programmable photonic integrated circuits, but by introducing silicon photonic MEMS. Now, if you think about programmable circuits, the first thing that usually comes to mind is electronics. And indeed, if you look at the evolution of electronics over the past 70 years, we've come quite a long way building digital processors, field programmable gate arrays, uh, microcontrollers, etc. Compare that to photonics, and indeed you see that with photonics, we have also come to a long way towards integrating multiple functions on a chip. But there's a very big difference. In electronics, already quite early on, we saw the emergence of really programmable general purpose electronics, microcontrollers, FPGAs. In photonics, all these circuits that we see today are application-specific ICs designed for one particular application or function. So what is the role and what is the future of general purpose photonic integrated circuits that are like programmable and that can be used for many functions? And this is quite important. These so-called photonic FPGAs or programmable photonics or photonic processors would need to be not just configurable in software, but would also be needed to perform different functions so they can play a similar role as FPGAs and microcontrollers have played for the development and the industrial widespread use of electronics. So such a large scale general purpose programmable processor would look a bit like this. It would be a chip with optical inputs and outputs, but also with microwave inputs and outputs to, uh, to process high speed electronic signals. And that's useful because photonics with all its bandwidth is quite uh, quite powerful to process these high-speed electrical signals. In practice, it would look a bit more like this, where you have indeed a chip with optical inputs and outputs, which I indicated at the top, where and where the microwave inputs and outputs are essentially nothing but converters into the optical domain. So your microwave signals are modulated onto an, an optical carrier and demodulated using photodetectors uh, back into the microwave domain. And all the processing happens in this central part, which we call a programmable all-to-all -all scatter matrix. Now that particular magic block is essentially nothing more than an electrically controlled waveguide circuit, which allows you to couple light from any port to any set of other ports. So you can describe the functionality by this matrix, which contains complex numbers for phase and amplitude, and frequency dependent response to make wavelength filters. So if you can control all these scatter parameters, you can control the function of this entire circuit. Now, the big question is, how would you make this programmable all to all scatter matrix? Well, the solution was already proposed uh, quite a lot of years ago, like five, six years ago, uh, in the form of recirculating waveguide meshes. Essentially, you take a set of loops, waveguides or uh, arranged in loops, with tunable coupling elements between all the loops. And that way, if you inject light, by coupling the light between the loops, you can circulate the light between all the ports. And you can do that with these square meshes, or you can do that with hexagonal meshes, which are a bit more flexible. Now, the key element or the key building block to make this work is called a two by two optical gate. And a two by two optical gate is essentially a four port device which acts as a tunable coupler in, that, in the sense that it mixes the light from the two input waveguides into the two output waveguides, but it also adds a phase control. So you can control the phase delay between these ports. So the minimum components that you need to make this work are essentially just two. You need a way to induce a phase shift and you need a way to induce a tunable coupling. And if you have these two components, you can essentially build these larger scale meshes by hooking them up together in which you can reroute your light just by switching your optical gates between a bar state and a cross state. You can even, because each gate is a four port, you can even route multiple routes of light through the same gate. Now, it becomes more interesting when you use the gates not just in bar and cross state, but also in partial coupling states, because now you can redistribute the light through multiple paths in the circuit, and you can even recombine the lights. So now what you've created is essentially 
a programmable interferometer. And the interesting thing is, in these recirculating meshes, it's fairly easy to introduce a path delay in your interferometer. So what you've created now is a wavelength-dependent response, essentially a tunable filter. And you can also implement filters using resonators by routing your lights into a loop. So you have the building blocks and the basic functionality to make these programmable scatter matrix coupling any port to any other port and implementing a wavelength dependent response. Now, the first implementation of such a circuit was done by the Politecnico de Valencia. The group of José Capmani demonstrated this seven cell circuit, so seven hexagonal cells, 60 tunable, uh, 60 phase shifters in the cells to make everything work uh, already in 2017. And with these 60 Phase shifters, you can already configure the circuit into a hundred different, uh, different ports or functions. Now you can see that there's some clear bottlenecks here for scaling this up. You see all these metal wires going to the outside world. What happens if you want to scale this up to hundreds or even thousands of tunable elements, much larger circuit? What is needed to enable this scaling? Well, First, you need really good phase shifters and tunable couplers. They need to be compact, have a short optical length, a low optical loss, and preferably consume little or no electrical power. On top of that, you need to be able to integrate many of those on the same chip, so they all need to work, they all need to be connected to the electronics, and they need to work together with the existing components on the circuit, like high-speed modulators and detectors. So in order to build all these good actuators, you need to be able to integrate it into a silicon photonics platform. And the platform that we have been using in Morphic is IMEX silicon photonics platform called ICIP 50G, which has all the typical bells and whistles that you find of today's silicon photonics, which is waveguides of different types, ribs and strip waveguides, germanium photodetectors, high speed modulators, high efficiency grating couplers. Now in such a platform, the most commonly used way to implement a phase shifter or an actuator is using a heater, where you essentially put a resistor close to your waveguide, either on top or on the side of your waveguide. You send a current through it, you heat it up, and you induce a phase shift. And this works really well, but it consumes a constant power of multiple milliwatts, up to tens of milliwatts for each heater to induce a pi phase shift. That's not scalable to really large numbers. The alternative that's available in these platforms is carriers, where you have diodes and capacitors implemented inside the waveguide core, which is very good for high speed modulation, but it induces losses and they're very long phase shifters, so not really suitable for the applications that we need. They're not low loss, they're not compact. So the solution that we're building in Morphic is to introduce mechanical components, microelectromechanical systems, movable silicon devices. Now, this idea is not entirely new. MEMS have been used in photonics for already quite some time, like more than a decade. And it's a quite logical way to actuate photonic functions because you're moving silicon. That's a very big change in the refractive index that you're inducing. And it's actually quite easy to imagine how you could build a tunable coupler device, for instance. Let's say you start with a directional coupler where the two waveguides are suspended. Now, if you move these two waveguides apart, you change the coupling coefficient. And you can induce that movement either horizontally or vertically. And it even works with waveguides that are stacked on top of one another where you can vertically move them together or apart. And this concept can easily be extended to, imp to implement a phase shifter instead of a tunable coupler. You just have to replace the one of the movable waveguides with a thinner beam of silicon that acts as a perturbation to your main waveguide core. The challenge of these actuators, however, is to integrate them together with all the other functions in a silicon photonics platform. If you look at a, a standard silicon photonics platform, you see that the waveguides are encapsulated with a dielectric and metal stack that takes care of all the electrical wiring. So if you want to make these waveguides movable, you would have to open this electric stack and then basically protect all the other functions for because the next step would be to release these waveguides using a very aggressive vapor HF edge. So it takes a bit of thinking to make sure that you have a process to release these waveguides to, the, to be freestanding without damaging any of the other functionalities of your platform. 
So if you optimize this carefully, what you get is these nice results. So we have these freestanding rip waveguides, which can then transition into fully freestanding, free hanging waveguides that can then be used to make MEMS devices or mechanical actuators. And essentially what you're seeing here, this little ski that is protruding away from the waveguide is actually a very narrow beam of silicon that is used as a perturbation for the phase shifter. So this phase shifter would look a bit like this. You have your waveguides where your light is just going from input to output. And then you have a thin beam of silicon sitting right next to it, suspended by these folded springs and on a movable shuttle that is actuated by the comb drive. So if you want to characterize such a phase shifter, well, the easy way to characterize a phase shifter is embedding it into a Maxander interferometer. And here you already see one of the challenges because this phase shifter is exposed to air, but all the other components in the interferometer are encapsulated in oxide. So you have an input fiber coupler, you have the splitter, you have the delay line, etc. Now, if we model this phase shifter and its, its response, we get an estimate that it will take about 30 volts of actuation voltage to induce a pi phase shift. In reality, we find that because of small variations during the fabrication compared to the design, we already get a pi phase shift for a 20 volt actuation. And this with an insertion loss of only 0.2 dB. Now, this is a mechanical device. So that means that it will respond to vibrations as well. And indeed, if we uh, do a frequency analysis, we find that this has a mechanical resonance around 500 kilohertz. And so we can, we can get a fairly good response uh, time on the order of like less than 10 microseconds. Now, this is just a phase shift. If we want to make a tunable coupler, we basically just have to apply the same principle, but now as a base component, we need a directional coupler. So we first optimized the direct, a directional coupler, a freestanding directional coupler to have a broadband response with a quite high efficiency and low insertion loss. And then we embedded this freestanding directional coupler into a movable device. So now you have normally a path of light where most of your light gets coupled to the drop board. But if you then actuate it, you move the two waveguides apart in, in the plane of the chip and you go from across coupling to a bar coupling. Now this is an example of the fabricated device which was presented in detail uh, in June at the transducers conference. But we see that if we increase the gap, we see a very uh, clear uh, oscillation in the transmission from drop to passport. So we get a very high extinction ratio here. You can also use, instead of horizontal actuation, you can use vertical actuation. So you can put the same directional coupler now in a different structure where you can actuate vertical movement by applying a voltage between the substrate and the waveguide. And so pulling the waveguides apart, but in the vertical direction. The advantage of this technique is that it requires a lower voltage because the springs with which this coupler is suspended are weaker than the springs used for the in-plane actuator. So this can be driven with a CMOS compatible voltage less than five volts. And indeed here, this is what what we see, this is the fabricated device. And if you look at the transmission curves, when it's actuated or not actuated, we see that we can get a clear switching from drop to pass uh, with a quite high extinction ratio of like 15 to 20 dB. Now we can, we can also, instead of making these analog tunable devices, we can also make very compact switch devices. Uh, for instance, and in in this is an example of a very simple tip to tip switch where you have this center input waveguide, which can be moved to couple to either output port one or output port two. This is a kind of tricky device because it's quite compact and you need to optimize the mechanical, optical and electrical properties in such a way that you get a good linear movement compared uh, when you apply a voltage and that you also uh, get a good optical coupling between the two tips. And indeed, if we characterize this device, we see that we get a very strong uh, extinction ratio or ejection ratio when we switch the device in either the left or the right state. Now these devices are quite useful and they're low power because they're electrostatically actuated, but there's quite a bit of challenges. And one of them is that they're essentially uh, exposed to air, while the rest of the waveguides that are 
not in the MEMS cavities are covered in an oxide cladding. So that means that we have on a larger circuit quite a lot of transits between these air clad devices and oxide clad devices. And that means that this transit needs to be properly engineered, not just from an optical point of view, but also from a processing point of view to make sure that when we process these devices, that the, that the attack of the buried, uh, of the, the buried oxide and the attack of the uh, top cladding does not destroy the devices in, uh, that have to be oxide clad. So you have on one hand the challenge of making sure that there are proper protection layers, but at the same time, you have to make sure that any optical passage through these layers is not accompanied with a lot of reflections. And so the solution that we came up with was actually a fairly simple one. We, we engineered a rip wave guide in such a way that when the light passes through this, uh, this cross section and these multiple interfaces, the reflections are minimized. And indeed, this is an example uh, with an SEM picture. So you see the rip wave guide, it's tapered down its optimal width, and then it goes through these multiple interfaces and it finally disappears underneath the oxide stack. And we cascaded 60 of these transits to characterize their losses. And we find that we get about uh, 0.05 dB per transit for different implementations. The second problem, if you expose these devices to air, is that they are uh, liable to damage. So they're exposed. If a dust particle falls on one of these MEMS devices, it's broken. So for long-term reliability, you need to cover them up. And so what we've come up with in the Morphic project is a local sealing mechanism where we apply a silicon lid on top of one or more MEMS cavities by thermal compression bonding. So we use the the metal features that are already present in the platform to generate, to create these ceiling rings, which can then be used to apply a silicon, uh, a silicon cap that is sitting on top of the, the MEMS device. And this can be done in vacuum or in a controlled gas environment. And the process is wafer scale. At this point, uh, we do this, uh, this is done by KTH, uh, 100 millimeter wafers, and has a very high yield. You can also, uh, you can also process lids of different dimensions and different shapes so you're basically just constrained by the type of lithography and patterning that you can do on these lids and you uh, if we test them over a longer time we also see that we get that the vacuum is uh, maintained for an extended duration so we we don't see these lids failing quite often of course, these lids only make sense if after the whole bonding process, your MEMS devices still work. So this is definitely something we tested. And indeed, we see that if we, if we test our phase shifter, which is embedded in a Maxander interferometer, we still, after the ceiling, see a very clean uh, Maxander interferometer spectrum, which we would not see if the device would have collapsed or failed. Um, to further test them, because they're mechanical devices, we also uh, subjected them to vibration tests, to temperature cycling, and again, we see that uh, we don't have a significant impact on the performance of the devices. Now, with this technology, this allows us basically to extend our ICIP 50 g platform with more components, MEMS components, into a process design kit that allows us to build larger circuits. And that's exactly what we've been doing. So we've taken these tunable couplers and these phase shifters and organized them into these hexagonal waveguide meshes. And this is one of the first circuits that we built based on, uh, on these, uh, these components. So we have 24 hexagonal cells. They're organized into a layout which doesn't on first sight look hexagonal, but the connectivity creates these hexagonal cells. And it has 200 uh, tunable elements. So if we zoom in on one unit cell, you see that there are three phase shifters, three tunable couplers and there's, uh, there's like multiple of these blocks repeated into 24 unit cells. Now, if we look at how this, how this would look on the larger chip, we see that one of these unit cells only consumes a small fraction of the entire chip, and there's mo many more circuits on this chip. So one of the challenges that we face when designing these chips and building these circuits is the electrical interconnect. How do we... Uh, now, how do we electrically address all the functions that are on this chip? And for that, we came up with a standardized way on the layout, and you, you already see some regularity here. We basically defined a mesh of unit cells with fixed locations of bond paths. And so by, with, by using the standard layout, we could now devise a mechanism to 
connect all of these unit cells together with electric uh, electrical uh, drivers in a generic packaging approach. And so our 24 cell circuits is only one of the many circuits that can this can address this way. Of course, this gives you 3,300 DC connections that need to be interfaced to the outside world on top of the 24 microwave connections and the 72 fibers. So Tyndall has been developing a very large scale interposer technology using a ceramic interposer that can handle the high speed signals with 21 layers, essentially allowing you to integrate all these different, uh, these different DC connections to a generic uh, output that can be interfaced to electronics. Now this is still under development. So in the meantime, we've been using like a, a, a less scalable, but a shorter term approach using single layer glass interposers fabricated at EPFL, which can then uh, be connected to a 72 fiber array mounted on a mechanical substrate and wire bonded and finally connected to the outside world through a set of a set of 40 pin flex cables and these flex cables then interface with the driver electronics which have also been developed uh, by Tyndall uh, specifically developed for these MEMS devices so this means we need high voltage drivers 60 volts but every driver board can drive up to 64 MEMS devices at the same time read out 32 photo detectors and everything is controlled with a microcontroller, so it's cascadable and stackable into much larger setups, for instance, uh, up to 12 boards are, are planned for larger scale demonstrators. Now, the electronics is just one aspect of uh, the driving. On top of that, you need the logic to control everything, the routines to control everything. So in parallel, we've been developing a software framework that maps the chip circuit layout with configuration routines for this mesh that can drive the hardware and at the same time uh, drive a circuit simulator to check whether the results that you've programmed actually make sense. Now that these configuration routines, uh, you need to be able to divide uh, to implement filters to implement routing. So we've come up with a way to represent our mesh circuit into a graph representation that can then be used by network routing algorithms specifically optimized by graphs uh, to, uh, to come up with different configurations. Now, it's a bit tricky, of course, because these graphs need to be really representative of the photonics. It means they should only allow the flows of light that are actually physically possible on the chip. So after a bit of thinking, we came up with this eight point or eight node graph representation for each individual gate. Uh, which respects the flow of light through the circuit and allows you to, uh, to apply uh, existing graph algorithms to do routing in your photonic circuits. For instance, this is an example where we try to route six connections at the same time uh, using congestion negotiation to make sure there are no collisions and balancing of the paths so to make sure that the paths are roughly the same losses. You can use similar routines to build distribution trees or to actually reroute devices when you detect that something is broken inside your mesh. So I hope that this makes it clear that even though a lot of the focus uh, in these programmable photonic circuits is on the, the generation of these mesh, wave, uh, mesh devices with uh, high quality actuators, you can only get a fully programmable photonic chip if you combine the photonics with the electronics and the, uh, and the software layers and everything nicely packaged together. So you need this kind of entire, uh, entire technology stack to make everything work. Now what you end up with, if you can combine all this, is indeed a generic programmable optical processor that can do quite a lot of functions, both for microwave and optical applications. Now what this gives you is a quite unique advantage because today, building photonic circuits is quite a costly and specialized enterprise. If you have a programmable photonic circuit, your development time for new applications would be drastically reduced. Uh, and potentially, if you build a new application, you would have a lower cost and much faster time to market. And because these circuits can be programmable, that means that they can in principle be upgraded or can be, can be uh, fixed in software, just like you are familiar now with most programmable electronics. But probably one of the biggest advantages of having a programmable photonic circuit uh, 
is that suddenly you address a much larger community. Essentially, you give the circuits into the hands of electrical engineers and software engineers. And for every photonic engineer, you have 10 electrical engineers and 100 software developers. So suddenly your addressable market, your community for innovation is two, order, two orders of magnitude larger than if you would stick with application specific photonic circuits. So this is actually what, what we're aiming at with Morphic is to implement and enable these programmable photonic circuits using our MEMS technology, but in such a way with all the higher layers of electronics and software on top that you can really build a general purpose programmable photonic circuit. So with this, I would like to just thank the entire Morphic team for all the work that they've been putting into this project and these very nice results that we've been getting up till now. And I'm ready for questions.